Uh, we're moving on to the hip and mini hip session. So four more talks. Uh, I believe we've got uh, one in person and, and three remote. Uh, which we've been doing this morning, swapping back and forth between in the room and remote. And it's been working well. So the first speaker we have needs no introduction at all. It's uh, Aldo Vizzoni. And Aldo is going to talk about the mini THR. Uh, Aldo is obviously well known and, and comes to us from his clinic in, uh, in Italy. So with that, I will hand over to Aldo. And uh, Aldo, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. I am. I hope I'm on, uh, on the phone. Yes. So um, we can. Uh, I am very pleased to be here, at least uh, in a, um, in a remote. It's the first time I'm not uh, attending the Kion Symposium in person. So I'm very sorry for that. But at least I'm here as um, in remote. So I will be pleased to speak to you about our um, uh, preliminary, preliminary experience with a mini THR. And uh, of course, I need to um, declare my conflict of interest because I am a paid teacher in the Kiona uh, Total Hip uh, um, um, Arthroplastic course. But I have no other financial relationship with the Kiona. So the mini uh, cementless Zurich THR is a unique non-cemented THR for small dogs and cats and is available since last year. It's the same design of regular implants, just smaller sizes. That was made possible by the three main revolutions introduced by the fifth and sixth generation of Zurich THR. First of all, the hydroxyapatite coating of the titanium implants uh, that was um, uh, providing a very quick host integration. Then, very important, the peak uh, cup liner with uh, carbon fiber peak rings uh, that uh, uh, substituted the ultra high molecular um, weight uh, polyethylene liner that was causing some um, erosion in, in few years. So, that was not providing a full life guarantee as we want to have for our total liver replacement in dogs. And then the ceramic heads that uh, reduce even more the wear. So the available um, implants are um, um, suitable for treat old cats and also dogs from uh, 2 to 18 kilograms. It means that we have a stem sizes from 3 millimeter, 4 millimeter, 5, 6 millimeter. And the cup sizes, uh, they range from 10 to 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, up to 21 millimeter, just to provide a hybrid combination with the regular sizes. And the head sizes, they vary from 6 to 8, 10, 12 millimeter, up to 16 millimeter when we do the uh, combination with the uh, regular sizes. So we have a very several different combination between stem and size because uh, uh, small animals have quite um, variation in the uh, relationship between the acetabular size and the um, uh, stem size, the femoral size. So we can move from uh, the stem, um, the three millimeter stem can move uh, uh, forward for the cups that are suitable for the four millimeter and vice versa. So that is very important because as I can see, I can show you in this uh, example, on the left side, you see a cat uh, with a large femoral canal and a very small acetabulum. And on the right side, uh, we see that uh, Jack Russell with uh, a quite large acetabular uh, size compared to a very narrow femoral canal. The smaller cups, uh, uh, the 10, 12, 15, 16 millimeter, they miss the um, um, peripheral, the peripheral um, shell in titanium shell. So they are all made by carbon fiber reinforced peak with a, just a small ring of metal in the periphery to as a um, X-ray marker. Those uh, small caps are the more tricky to be uh, in, to be um, set inside the acetabulum because they really need a very very precise uh, 
as the tabular rimming. Also, we have a guideline for the body weight of the dog, so the most indicated uh, size of the, of the implants. Uh, for instance, the three millimeter stem is suitable for dogs uh, or cats from two to five kilograms, and the four uh, size, uh, the stem four, is uh, suitable for four to nine mm, kilograms and so on. That is a useful guideline also to provide a good guarantee to the owners for the, um, uh, for the tolerability of the implants according to the body weight. About the necks, we have the huge variability of necks because we need to have a short, medium, long, and extra long neck according to the combination between the stem and the head. So each stem and each head require his neck. For that reason, uh, we need to know very well all the combination that we can uh, use uh, uh, to be sure that for our animal that is in treatment, we can select the best combination of implants. Instrument set is very, uh, very precise. So we have a general instrument set with the reamers, uh, both the femur and for the stabulum. And then we have specific sets for the three millimeter, four millimeter, five and six millimeter. Planning is very important, of course, because here we have a minimal variation. So it's very important to have a good calibration and to measure in the classic views that we are using for large animal, for more large animal like um, the yoga view, the lateral view, and also the standard view and the frog view. So we can uh, uh, make an evaluation of what we can expect in surgery, but again, it's very important the final size should be judged when we are in surgery. Table fixation is quite tricky because of the very light uh, body weight of those animals, so we need to provide a good system of fixation. We have our system, which is special devices and press the spine and the iliac wing on the back and the pubis on the ventral side. And then, of course, we need to check them on this fluoro because any minimal variation can change a lot our orientation in surgery. As you can see in this cat, as soon as we took the fluoro, you see how this assembly, how not uh, superimposed are the ilium bodies so we can move the patient up to have a proper uh, lateral lateral view, so we can rely on our um, surgical landmarks. About a few surgical key points, uh, reamer of the femur, uh, first of all, we need to remove very gently the, the head and the remaining neck, uh, cautiously not to go to distal because otherwise you could need uh, two longer necks. Uh, and then to prepare the femoral canal, we open the femoral canal with a drill bits, a very small drill bits, 1.5 to 2 millimeter, and then we use a high speed burr to enlarge the entrance so of the femoral canal. Very interesting are those new uh, knitting all uh, flexible uh, reamers, uh, a violin shape at the tip, and so we can use that by hand or with low motion uh, drill, uh, low speed drill, so we can prepare very well the femoral canal. Of course, we need also to go with, um, sorry, we go with uh, um, small reamers, uh, small uh, um, uh, reamers again with a uh, drill, with the high speed drill, and then we test with the trial stem as uh, is done regularly for large animal, for larger dogs. Reaming of the cetabulum, I think, is the most tricky part because uh, we have a very, very little tolerance to achieve a good press fit. For that reason, we have reamers with increments of one millimeter, and now there's a new reamers are coming out with 0.5 millimeter of increments to be even more precise in our reaming, particularly for the final reaming, we are, should be at this 0.5 less of the diameter of the cup, so we can achieve a good press fit, even in small animal. The acetabulum should be reamed up to the medial cortex, particularly in cats where the acetabulum is not so deep, it's quite shallow, and so we need to have a good bone stock about cranial encoder. The implants are removed from their backs with the new gloves, as usual, 
and then the fixing the stem, for instance, to the to the jig is very delicate, but should be secure. Pay attention not to break the the locking screw and to align that very well with the um, the drill guides and also to set the drill stopper of the drill guide to be sure that they are going properly in the proper depth. The impact of the cap also is a little bit different than from big animals because here we have a very light body weight, so we need to be able to counteract the forces of impact of the cap. And you see that the assistant is holding a big hammer behind the iliac wing and the spine of the small animal. And so it can really counteract our strokes when we impact the cap. As soon as we have a partial impaction, checking that is well uh, um, seated according to the cranial and condal pillar, so it's well centered inside the septablum, we need to take a fluoro because uh, we could have moved the dog or the cat during surgery, as you can see in this case, the, the pelvis was a little bit oblique, so we they set the pelvis in a proper view, just tilting the table or moving the dog, and then we can check the ring of the cup to be sure that we have we achieve the proper angle of lateral opening. And then we can do our final impaction with a few decided strokes uh, well counteracted by the system. About uh, um, the clearance uh, from uh, the uh, cetabular cap and the neck osteotomy, we have a good uh, tools now that are um, uh, trial head and necks. So we put the head and necks inside the cap, and then we pull distally the uh, trochanter with a um, towel forceps or a point of reduction forceps to be sure that we have uh, enough space uh, to reduce the hip later on. Otherwise, we need to, to remove some more bone. Then we insert uh, very gently our uh, um, uh, our jig uh, inside the stem, the stem, sorry, inside the femoral canal using maneuvering the jig, and to be sure that we need to push the femur uh, dorsally and pull the uh, jig distally until we get inside and then we can set our anteversion of the stem as for big dogs. Drilling is a very precise, so uh, provided that you fix properly the stem to the jig, everything will be perfect. So we start with the, the position three and go on as for all the other cases. Um, every uh, set has its own uh, screwdrivers because of the difference in the size. So it's very important that your assistant is helping you, providing you the right uh, screwdriver for your screws. Finally, as soon as uh, is, uh, everything, uh, the stem has been fixed with all the screws, uh, we need uh, to insert our head and neck. So we assemble them in the table, and then we put the head and neck inside the cup, and then we pull uh, the trochanter until we can match the peg of the stem inside the neck, uh, the hole in the neck and then pulling again distally, and uh, we are, we'll, be able, we'll be able to match completely to have uh, the peg going full inside the neck. That is a very simple maneuver that can be done uh, even in larger dogs, but in small dogs it's very important because we have uh, much less room to make uh, our reduction. Then we do our testing for uh, stability as usual. We take our X-rays, very important to take consistent X-rays uh, to be able to measure the angle of lateral opening and the cap retroversion and also uh, the stem anteversion in a proper medial lateral view with the stifle and 90 degree. Our, my experience uh, in, uh, from uh, January 2020 to July this year is accounting for uh, 56 uh, total lip replacement in 47 animals. So we did 48 in uh, small size dogs. Some of them were bilateral and eight uh, THR in five cats because some of them had the bilateral. The most uh, represented breeds, as you can see from this video, from this slide, were toy poodles and then uh, Cocker Spaniel, Jack Russell, Jack Russell Terrier, Maltese dog and some Yorkshire, Brayton and so on.
And in cats, there were mainly Maine Coon and one British. My uh, experience is uh, uh, counting for a good follow-up because 95% uh, of my cases got at least uh, one follow-up at two months uh, and uh, several of them more um, a long-term follow-up up to 16 months. Uh, that was the first cat I did the uh, right side, as you can see in this case, uh, ging ginger, and uh, that is the follow-up at 16 months. And the longer follow-up I have in dogs is uh, 12 months, and this uh, Jack Russell Terrier, and as you can see on the right side, the, the appearance of the of the uh, follow-up, and these are the views, uh, the yoga view, the medial lateral view, and the lateral view of the pelvis. So what we can see in this uh, each race is a clean bone interface uh, with the implants, uh, a normal trabecular pattern, so there is no variation that could mean uh, some inflammation or loosening. So the implants, uh, the cup is well seated, and uh, it meaning also also integration. This is the Jack Russell. Uh, I show you the X rays, and you see that uh, it's running uh, as a normal dog, so it's not feeling any pain. Oreste is a British cat. Uh, this is uh, our follow up in this dog. He had a slipped fusel capitis, so this is a 10 months follow up. And the cat is uh, jumping and running happy, so there is no disturbance in this hip. And again, if you look at the x ray, you see a clean interface of the cup with the bone, and you can appreciate the small titanium spray on the back surface of the cup that makes that little bit of opacity in the x rays. About the implants I use, I use almost all the implants available. The most common I use was the, 14, the four millimeter stem and also the six millimeter in a more uh, big, uh, small dogs. About the cap, the cap, the most common use was the 12 millimeter because it was a common uh, for a small breed dog uh, like a Jack Russell or Yorkshire and so on. And, uh, but we use also other sizes. And about the head size, uh, the eight millimeter and the 10 millimeter are the most common use. The next size, uh, we always time to be too short, maximum to medium. So we had only three cases where we needed to use a long neck. But if you provide the proper cut of the osteotomy, not too deep, most of the time you will end up with a short or a medium neck. There are combination about um, uh, between the stem and the cup. It's interesting to see that the most common combination where the uh, stem three with the 12 millimeter cup or the stem four with the 12 millimeter cup and then going for bigger cases uh, like uh, the, uh, the stem five uh, with the uh, 20 and so on. About cats, uh, we had uh, the most common use are the four and five, but the four millimeter we use because at the beginning the five millimeter was not available. But for most cats, the five millimeter stem is the most suitable for this, uh, the size of their femoral canal. And the cap, uh, uh, the cap can vary from 12 to 14, and 14 require a, quite a big cat. In smaller cat, the 12 is more indicated. And again, short and medium neck are the most common used. And the same for the combination. Uh, we had those cases with the four millimeter stem because the five, the fee was not available. But I would say the most common combination nowadays will be the stem five or with uh, a, a cap 12 or 14. About complication, we had the three complications. So at the beginning, for the first 35 cases, we had no complications, so I was quite worried because some complication is required because we can understand very much from the complication how to improve our surgical technique and our case selection and implant selection. So we had a one spiral fracture of the femur distally to the stem in a cat, the first cat I I did, but the, the second size, a cap dislocation in a border collie and a luxation in a Yorkshire tech. So it's interesting to look at those complications. And this one in the cat was really 
not explainable, not easy to be explained, because the, the femur occurred very distal to the stem, so very distal to the screws also, or both lateral and medial, and uh, probably the, dog, the cat jumping to catch a fly. Anyway, we fixed that with a um, uh, plate, uh, with the uh, interferometer fixation, and that was uh, everything was okay at the follow up in nine months. The second complication was uh, a cap dislodgement, and uh, that was because uh, most probably a 20 millimeter cap was too big for this uh, very small border collie, uh, 15 kilogram. And so uh, in that um, let us to understand that it's better to stay with a smaller cap, but to have a good bone stock cranial encoder to provide a good press fit. Anyway, we went back and we replaced the same size cap, but going more deep in such a way to have a more, more bone contact and more uh, press fit. And the follow up at three months is okay. The less complication is the, the one which is still under observation in my clinic, was a very small Yorkshire Terrier with a septic necrosis of the femur head. And I had to use a three millimeter stem and a 10 millimeter cap with a six millimeter head. So the smaller size available. And uh, this dog uh, was okay until four weeks later, jumping from the sofa, it looks like it. So, of course, with a six millimeter head, we have a very short jumping distance for the fairway to get out. And after that luxation, it recurred after close rotation. We did an open reduction again with a longer neck, but it recurred again. So we are quite desperate in this um, small dog. And uh, we went to move the cup from 10 millimeter to 12 millimeter because the 12 millimeter can allow a eight millimeter head, which has a better um, jumping distance. Also, we try to improve the orientation of the cup to reduce the uh, retroversion and the, um, also the angle of lateral opening. And so nowadays, uh, as you can see in the image below here, is okay. So we are still keeping under observation, but this is a very demanding puppy, and you see is never standing, always jumping, always moving like a crazy. So very stressful post operative care. At the moment, after 15 days uh, after the revision, is uh, still okay, and uh, I hope it will remain. Uh, we had also an, one intraoperative complication, a trochanteric fracture because of excessive lateral reaming, and that was because uh, uh, we went uh, to a too big stem. Why? Because the three millimeter stem was too small. The four was a little too big. We wanted to put a, a, that uh, uh, that uh, bigger stem, but uh, of course we weakened the trochanter and then we uh, caused the fracture during the reaming and the reduction. But that was saved with uh, was fixed with a, a plate, and you can see that at three months everything is okay. I want to go back to my uh, small Yorkie, just to tell you that uh, this experience uh, um, taught us that it's better to have a, a, a cup that is 11 millimeter that can hold the eight millimeter head. So uh, we can uh, use uh, that instead of a 10 millimeter with a six millimeter head, because I think that this combination of 10 millimeter cup and six millimeter head is uh, quite a risky of luxation. While uh, 11, which is so little bigger, but with the eight millimeter uh, head would be much more safe. So in conclusion, that is a quite very positive preliminary experience. It's a very state of the art system. I must give my compliments to Steeple Zinn and Slobodan Tepici because they really design incredible instruments and implants. It's technically possible, but requires a lot of precision and concentration. I would say that it's a stressful surgery, a stomach ache, in small, particularly in smaller animals, when you need to put a three or four millimeter stem. There is very little tolerance for mistakes, but the, ex, the functional recovery is really excellent, and the satisfaction and gratitude for it, um, from the owner is really outstanding. This is the first cat I did. I follow that uh, almost every week uh, with the owner, very, very 
a keen to provide a good feedback. And you see here the 12 days after surgery, the dog, the cat is quite comfortable. And here is 20 days after surgery, so he's already moving very uh, happy without any discomfort. And going uh, later, this uh, next uh, is uh, for the uh, 60 days uh, after surgery, the, dog, uh, the cat is uh, jumping uh, very happy without any difficulty to do that movement. And so the owner was very happy with his uh, cat. And this dog, a Maltese, with a luxation, traumatic luxation in the bed hip, and so a grade four lameness. But look at this dog, 80 days after surgery, is running like a crazy. So the owner was so satisfied to see his dog jumping, running, even if it was not so young. And again, this is one of the last cases I did. You see in a Yorkshire, in a, sorry, in a toy poodle, nine year old, how bad hips he had. So bad uh, and coxa plana, bad um, osteoarthritis of the hip is not a prerogative of big dogs too, but also small dogs that have so bad and painful um, hips and the, the, the dog was uh, refusing to go walking. The owner was uh, carrying on the on the back. So look at this dog just uh, after the second hip. This is, uh, Nine, uh, four, um, uh, the follow up is uh, five and three months later. So the, the dog looks uh, younger, look a puppy. He's not looking the same dog, but I agree, I assure you that it's the same dog. And he's uh, so happy to run, and the owner was really, really satisfied. I want to acknowledge my two assistants, uh, well trained, because uh, in, to do this surgery, you need a very good uh, trained assistant. So the prerequisite for approach mini THR are, first of all, trained and reliable assistant, sound experience and competence with uh, regular total knee replacement with an incident of complication possibly less than 5%, strong motivation because it's quite demanding, good case report to be able to do quite often, a financial investment because uh, all the sets and the stock of implants is required quite a lot of money, and also uh, a dedicated training course. And also a good masochist attitude, particularly when you want to do smaller animals, because I can assure you that it's really a stomachache. Okay, that is uh, unique in the world. I'm so happy to have been involved in the, in the trial cases at the beginning and to be able to do that regularly now. Thanks. Thank you for the attention and I will be able, very happy to reply to the questions if you have some. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aldo. Uh, that was very uh, informative and entertaining talk. Um, I think we're probably not going to be able to take a question right now in the interests of time. I hope you'll be able to uh, stay with us online until the end of the, of the session and perhaps answer some questions then. Uh, so thank you. Uh, so our next talk, which um, should have been the first talk, but uh, we swapped them around, is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Otto Lance joins us remotely from, uh, from the US. Uh, Otto is the Chief Medical Officer for Keon, and I'm sure many, if not all of you, will be aware of him or have met him. Um, and Otto's going to talk to us about the education pathway for total hip replacement and, um, any, and some updates to the system and how we got where we are. So uh, with that, welcome Otto. I will hand over to you. Okay, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are and where you're located. Um, today, uh, what I was planning on discussing is just the pathways that we've designed of how to get trained so that you can do not only the standard system, but then to move into the mini implants as well and to go over some of the pricing and how do you get sets available to do the, um, to practice. Um, this is a, a quick slide just to make you aware of the number of cases um, or number of dogs that are, uh, you know, represent the population of dogs. 
And it's estimated that, you know, between 15 or 20 percent of these dogs do have hip dysplasia. And again, the treatment options, only less than 1 percent are really getting total hip replacements, which is not in their best interest. A lot of them are being treated with non-steroidals, physical therapy. And currently, when you look at the statistics, only 16 percent or five of every 30 dogs who need a total hip replacement will actually get it. So. Again, I'm sorry, I'm just having some problems with the uh, clicker. Hopefully this will work. Um, the goal is, again, to remove the pain uh, in the hip in these dogs, get them off of non-steroidals, get them to an active life, and this will be done through the performance of a total hip replacement. So this is the pathway. Um, the way it's been divided is depending on how you enter the pathway, either being a beginner, a novice, or an experienced person. And we consider an experienced person someone that has either been resident trained, uh, is a diplomat of ECBS or ACBS, or has already been trained in another system. Novice is you know, usually somebody that's resident trained, or at least has about five years experience in orthopedics uh, in practice. And you can see down in the bottom under the description and the prerequisites for each of these pathways exactly what um, is required of you before you um, go ahead and enter or roll into the program of the pathways. The beginning, the fundamentals, uh, these are two the two gray boxes that you can see on your left. Those are for the um, the modules. They're not necessary, but they're highly recommended that you look at online before you start doing the total hip introduction course. And in the total hip introduction course, um, that is to go over the instrumentation, the planning, and to do dry bones. Um, so it is just uh, an introduction into going on and moving on from there. Um, it's a one day course. Um, it can be done online or in person. I think in person gives you a, a better perspective of what's involved. The difficulty with in person now is with the pandemic and travel. Then we'll go into the intermediate course. And even the people that are experienced or novice, everyone's going to need to take the intermediate course. Um, what's with the intermediate course, um, we are going to go over in a two-day course. This is when you start doing cadavers. This is when you start going into the intricacies of planning, positioning of the patient, which is very important for doing the preoperative work. And then after the completion of the intermediate course, this is when you can start uh, renting or purchasing the equipment so that you can start doing your three wet lab cases that will be sent in and we'll go over the form for that in just a second. But this is to help you do three cadaver dogs with, you know, your the assistant that's going to be helping you with your surgical technician so that you can get used to doing them. You can get critiqued and you will also critique your radiographs as well. You will be assigned a mentor, so somebody that can help you through this process. And please don't think of this process as a pass-fail. It's actually a way so that you can improve on your skills because, as you know, as a surgeon, everyone enters with a different um, skill base, um, and then that way we can help you. Um, I don't know if that's still in focus, Dan, if um, – the, the PowerPoint, it's really blurry on my side, so if somebody could work on that, that would be great. Um, and then after that, you will go into um, a mentoring program with, um, with someone that will help you for your two cases, and then we'll have a minimum follow-up time so that we can reconnect with you and we can discuss these cases and go over potential uh, complications as well. At that point, you'll move into what's called the advanced. And in the advanced course, this is when we go over complications, how to handle revisions or how to handle difficult cases. Because again, to keep your first cases at a um, relatively um, um, easy um, program, that would, that would help. 
Um, the other thing is we will also go over many cases so that you will understand um, the, the mini system that Aldo just went over. Again, this is much more difficult. But the bottom line is that we are going to try to walk you through a pathway so that you can understand complications and how to deal with things that are um, out of the ordinary in the advanced course. Again, the mentoring um, isn't made is it meant to be temporary? If you do need help in future cases, uh, we certainly do get a lot of requests to help with certain cases, templating of certain cases, and so on. Um, so then moving along after you get through the intermediate course, this is when you can actually buy or rent um, instrument sets so that you can do your cadaver cases. Again, we're gonna go over the exact um, requirements for what you do when you submit a cadaver case. But the goal of this is, again, we're going to do your preoperative assessment radiographically so that we know that you know how to position these patients. Um, in the cases that we've seen and in the entries that we've already evaluated, I can tell you that preoperative radiographs is something that can be difficult. It's radiographs that maybe not everyone takes routinely, but they're very important for the planning. And again, to go over the planning and to also complete the postoperative assessment, which you will get back in detail with um, comments and suggestions on how you can improve. This is the link that you can see about how to submit um, your cases. And then we have a set advisors that will look at your case. Your entries are anonymous, so we don't know who you are and we will just go over um, the radiographs themselves and, and comments. And again, if you don't succeed the first time, we would encourage you to resubmit another case because we want to make sure that you're on, you have a good solid foundation on doing just set number of standard uh, total hips before you move into the advanced, which is going to cover complications and again, go over uh, the mini sets, which are going to be uh, more difficult yet. So here's an example of the form for the um, the total hip uh, cadaver, the evaluation form. So what we're going to do is, um, again, we're going to look at the the ventral door, the lateral and the yoga view and evaluate them to make sure you will see how many points, zero through five points for each of the categories and what the minimum number of points are for being approved. Uh, you will need to do three successful cases. So it's again, it's important when you look at the breakdown, the important thing to remember with the breakdown is that you, there are a lot of points that are going to be based on the, um, um, there are a lot of uh, points that are going to be based on just the positioning of these cases on um, you know, on the the radiographic table. So just make sure you take your time on that. For the post-operative evaluations, we are going to look at what we consider the the minimum of the um, angle of lateral opening, the retroversion, the impaction, and again on the femoral stem, we're going to be looking for the same things. Uh, you will get a score, and then again, a, a greater than 15 is passing, less than 15 means that you need to submit yet another case. Um, partnerships and business support, this is something that Keon will offer. Um, you can see the charts here. Um, hopefully these are still current, um, but these are the costs for the sets and, and what they charge. Again, if you do submit um, or you do get one within 30 days of taking the intermediate course, the good thing is that you get a 10% discount. They'll know exactly what you need to get. Now, do you need to get every set right off the bat? No, you certainly don't. If you're hesitant about whether you do really want to be part of a total hit process, the other thing that would be important to do is just to make sure um, that you rent it so that you can see how things go. And again, other parts of the course that I left out earlier is we will instruct you about, you know, what is it going to take to actually um, uh, to build up a total hip uh, surgical system and to get clients. And again, as far as, as marketing goes.
Um, again, this is just to help you again to form a, a partnership is that we can certainly um, help you as far as the ordering so that we know what you order throughout the year, what are you going to need to be stocked in and what your need, um, you know, what you're not going to need to be stocked in. So that's going to be important as well. Um, there are payment plans um, which will help throughout the, the year as well, depending on um, how busy you are and exactly how many cases that you are doing. And also uh, some things that would help in this is being upgraded if there is um, an upgrade that's going to be necessary. Uh, the other thing that's really important is in order to raise some sort of awareness about total hip replacements, because not all owners know this, not all referring veterinarians know this, Keon will help you as far as marketing materials, providing you with uh, detailed pictures, videos. And again, since everything is based uh, these days on social media, um, it will help you with uh, social media information as well and informational uh, with the owners. Uh, there are good videos here that you can see on Keon's website that does explain what a total hip is. Um, I do use those. Um, owners really seem to like that. It helps them to understand exactly the uh, technical aspects of a total hip in a way that they can understand. Again, aftercare videos, which are going to be important for the owners. So the goal of this is to actually help you from start to finish to be a successful uh, total hip surgeon, which is the goal. I know that submitting cadavers, um, some people are uh, reluctant to do so, but it's really in your best interest to do that. So you do, in a way, get a stamp of approval so that you can be, you know, approved to do total hips. In the past, this was not done, and there were a lot of complications that were secondary uh, to this. Um, this did take a lot of time and effort uh, to put together. I'm sure if you have um, any questions or any concerns, you can certainly reach out to Keon um, uh, Marika, who I need to thank uh, for this presentation and also for her past help with the submissions. Um, they can help as well. We are trying to get more courses that are available uh, throughout the year. It's been very difficult with the pandemic as far as scheduling and, and having to cancel courses, which is difficult. Um, but other than that, you can find everything on the website. If you have any questions, I'm sure that uh, during the break, uh, you can go to someone from Keon and they can um, explain in more detail some of this. But this is just a rough outline so that you understand that now we do have a system in place so that we can train you no matter what your entry level is to being a successful surgeon. Um, a lot of it is motivation on your part, which is going to be important. And, and again, a financial responsibility. I know that this is not a cheap endeavor, but it is one that will provide a lot of satisfaction to you as a surgeon and also to, to the owners. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Um, a big thank you for Marika as well for all her help and Aldo and Steve um, for their help and input into this uh, process as well. And if you have any questions, again, feel free to reach out. You can email myself, you can email Marika, or they can send emails to me if you send it through them. And again, thank you for your attention and thank you for coming to the symposium. Thank you very much, Otto, um, for, for your presentation. Uh, and I think we're, we're going back to what, uh, what Guy said this morning, first thing, that we're very much a company about innovation and education. So we've seen both sides of that. Um, and our next speaker is really going to address even more the innovation side. So um, our next speaker is uh, Roman Preuss. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, Roman is the VP of Development at Ceramtech in Germany. Uh, and it, he will be talking about the development of ceramic surfaces for implant applications such as Keon's total hip replacement. Thank you, Roman. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. At first, a great thanks to uh, Kion, to Guy, Dominica, and Stephen, and the whole team for the invitation and for the opportunity to today to present about uh, ceramics as a material and the abilities um, of the material to be used in uh, veterinary implants. 
Dominika asked me to introduce myself at first a little bit, uh, since I'm completely new in this community. My name is uh, Roman Preuss, I'm 47 years old, and I'm a mechanical engineer. So I'm not coming from medicine or from veterinary business, I'm a mechanical engineer, and I'm uh, at Saram Tech since uh, 2004, different positions, uh, and I'm responsible for the development in the medical pro uh, products, position, uh, products division right now. Ceramtech is a company. Oh, at first a little uh, anecdote from my side. Um, what I realized when I prepared my presentation is um, my first summer job as a student was actually in Switzerland, not far from here, 50 kilometers. And I can tell you I was a bloody beginner at that time. <laughs> yeah. So um, when I come to Switzerland, it's always a little comeback for me and uh, I can say I'm happy to be here. <laughs> at Ceramtech, we um, have a uh, Verilox as a, as a brand which is limited to uh, veterinary implants, that's important to know. And we have the great uh, possibility to work with the fascinating material. We are working with advanced ceramics and uh, that means, um, please forget the dishes or whiteware that you have at home. It follows the same uh, physical and chemical principles, but advanced ceramics is uh, something completely different. We are talking about ceramic materials that are specifically made and designed for application in industrial and in uh, medical um, products. And I want to point your attention just to this little rectangular plate here. Because this is a cutting tool. That means it's a little plate made from ceramics, which is on top of a chisel or um, a milling head and which is used to machine metals. Yeah. The strong metals that you know from your daily life, which are not easily to uh, machine. And with these ceramic uh, plates, you are able to machine these uh, metal parts and the properties that are used here for the specific materials is, uh, of course, the strength of the material, the incredible hardness of the material, um, its resistance against heat, and of course, its resistance against abrasion. And another anecdote to this uh, plate, the material which we're talking today, the zirconia toughened alumina, the pink stuff which you have seen in the presentations before for the little ball heads. That material started its uh, origin uh, in the development of such a cutting tool. And during the development, the engineers realized that the material that they have in the development right now, it's much more better suited for application in an implant system than in such a cutting tool. A few words to Ceramtech. Uh, Ceramtech as a company uh, is a global supplier for ceramic components. Um, we have a sales of approximately 550 million per year uh, with 3,400 um, employees worldwide. Um, and uh, the history of Ceramtech is uh, longer than 100 years. So but let's, let's jump directly to, into the medical applications. We have uh, three brands, or let's say four brands, for different ceramic materials. The Biolox ceramics uh, from the human, uh, human implants, then Densilox for the dental implants for humans as well, and then what we are talking today, Verilox ceramics for veterinary applications. And of course, if it's necessary for medical applications, for, for instance, for instruments or other things, uh, then we also can, uh, can uh, um, provide ceramic components for medical equipment. The Biolox implants for use in uh, human hip have the longest and uh, strongest history in our company. In the meantime, we manufactured more than 20 million implants over the decades. The history starts more than 40 years ago. And um, today we manufacture more than 1 million components per year of these implants for use in uh, human hip implantation. And so I can say, whatever you need for the veterinary use, how many implants, uh, I can tell you, I think we are ready to do it. Our material competence uh, goes over several ceramic com uh, compositions, uh, mainly based on zirconia or alumina or a mixture between both. And we can manufacture the ceramics in a dense state, which means as a bulk material, um, which uh, provides the strongest um, strength of the material that you can, that you can achieve. And we can also um, Supply, supply that um, in a porous form for other kind of applications. 
and um, I provide you details today for both for the dense material as well as for the porous structure as well. So let's start with ceramics as a substrate material. As I said, if I want to use it as a substrate, I make it dense, no pores. Uh, what's important to know is that the surface state has always an influence on the mechanical properties and we can use that material very well for load bearing and for articulation. And of course, of interest for that are the mechanical properties, tribology, and not to forget, very important factor, biocompatibility. But let's look onto the material at first like the engineers do. The composition of the pink stuff that I mentioned before um, is an alumina matrix as basis. Roughly 80% of the material are alumina grains. Then we have a so-called zirconia phase inside, that means zirconia grains, roughly 17 volume percent, um, which make the material stronger. And we also have uh, platelets from other oxides which uh, also contribute to the strength of the material. So when you see here a bending strength, I don't have a point, I'm sorry for that, there, of uh, roughly 1400 megapascal, then that's quite a lot. But as I said before, the surface state always plays a role. Um, the second thing is, and that's an, a very important factor, is the hardness of the material with uh, 17 gigapascal. The hardness of ceramics is close to that of diamond, which means in a hard state, the only way to machine that material are diamond tools or, the second possibility, other ceramics which are harder than the one that you want to manufacture. The disadvantage of that is the material is expensive. So we have to keep that in mind. And um, a second factor to mention is ceramic is a brittle material, which means we achieve a high strength, of course, but the ceramic material has not the ability, like metals, to react to an overloading by plastic deformation. That's a disadvantage from a mechanical point of view, but it should not frighten us. We just keep it in mind and use that as a calculation during the development of the implants. Since I mentioned the surface preparation plays a role, it makes also sense to test the finally manufactured component. And we do this with a bunch of tests which were developed for the different kind of implants. And for the hip implants, the uh, test of choice is the axial burst test. And we also did this with the small heads for the veterinary, uh, veterinary application. And what we saw there, we did the test in a, co in a coordinate, completely in a coordinate, but oriented on the ISO standard for the hip implants and humans. What we saw there, that in most of the cases, we got an excessive deformation of the metal parts. And in some cases, we were able to fracture the ceramic heads. And um, the values that I uh, show you here is for a 16 millimeter head, we got a, a lowest fracture value of uh, 36 kilonewtons. And please think on that. 36 kilonewtons force that's comparable to 3.6 tons, metric tons. Uh, so that is what you can apply in axial direction onto these heads before you fracture them. And then it makes sense that we also have seen a huge deformation of the metal parts. A second test that I want to show you here is the scratch resistance. And that is important if you want to use ceramic for articulation services. Scratch resistance is tested by using a diamond tip, putting it on top of a surface, then move it over the surface and increase the axial force that acts onto this diamond tip. And the aim is to provoke a scratch in the surface. And what you see in these tests are two things, two differences in comparison to metal. The first one is that you get a much later appearance of the scratch, so you need a higher force to apply a scratch. Second one is the scratches are not as deep as in metal, and the third one is due to the effect that you don't have any plastic deformation in ceramics. You don't get any elevations on the rim of the scratch. So you don't see the classical burst that you know for metal pieces. And that's important if you combine the ceramic component, the ceramic surface, with a weaker material like we do in the hip implants. Since we have no burst here on these scratches, we protect the weaker component from abrasion. And that can you see in the wear testing, and this is a wear test from human hip implants where we tested ceramic in comparison to metal heads um, with the combination of polyethylene, which is a polymer. Um, and there you see, even under the 
ideal situation, that's the left-hand side, when you simply apply the standard gate cycle without any disturbances, like uh, third bodies which can make scratches, you see a smaller debris of the poly component and nearly no, no debris of the ceramic component. And if you apply th so-called third bodies, which could be small particles of cement or small particles of an HA coating, which you always will lose during the application of a press fit implant, um, then the, the wear debris in the metal and poly combination is much higher than in ceramic and poly. And the reason for this is the scratch resistance of the ceramic material. But let's go away from the mechanical testing to the chemical and biological testing. Uh, another advantage of ceramic is the low release or nearly no release of metal ions. And this was a test where we tried to do leaching of the components. We used three groups, two groups uh, with the testing components, metal heads, ceramic heads, which were put into bovine serum and the reference group, the control group was the bovine serum itself. And what you see there is in ceramics, you get the same results, no significant difference with the pure solution. So you don't get any measurable iron release. While if you take the metal components, you can see a significant increase of cobalt ions in the bovine serum. And also for chromium, you see, uh, you see an increase. The next topic of interest is the corrosion resistance of the material. If we combine different materials like ceramics and metals, as we do in modular implants, um, we have a risk of corrosion at the interface. And once again, there's a difference if you combine ceramics with a metal, then instead, instead combining metals among each other. And that was a test here uh, where we compared the results of uh, ceramic heads on um, titanium stems and cobalt chrome heads on titanium stems. And you see on the stem side with ceramic heads, you get a lower amount of material lost from the stem. And of course, the head itself, the ceramic head itself, which is shown on the left side, doesn't lose nearly any material, while even the cobalt chromium head loses material on the side in a significant uh, amount. But what happens to the particles if they are released to the human bodies? And also for these things, um, you can do tests. And this is a, uh, a study which we did um, with the reaction from uh, human cells to uh, debris in an amount which is um, comparable from the assumption with the amount of particles that could be released in the human body. And what you see there is the release of the immune modificator TNF-alpha with our ceramic particles is in the same range as if you um, test the cells alone. While if you use the uh, cobalt chromium particles at a certain threshold level, you get definitely a reaction of the cells. And the last topic which I want to point your interest here is the adhesion of bacteria. Infection was mentioned today, so it's also an issue in veterinary application. And with ceramics in the studies, we found that um, you have uh, less adhesion of bacteria on the surface. So if you compare ceramics with other materials used in implantation like metals and polymer, um, you see that uh, even after 24 hours, you have uh, a lower amount of bacteria on top of the surface than with the other materials which we compared it to. Let's come to the next topic. What, to, what is if I use ceramics as a porous material? Uh, once again, we can do it as a foam. We can apply the foam to a bulk material as a kind of a coating. Um, and of course, these kind of porous structures are well suited for a direct contact to bone, uh, for ingress of uh, bone cells, and um, I want to show you the biological evaluation of that later. As I said before, we can do it on top of a surface, then you simply have a, a layer of pores on top of a bulk material, and the second possibility is to use the foam itself to make uh, geometries from that, like the examples here, we can do wedges, uh, we can do cages, um, and the important thing is that the, okay. thank you. And the, <laughs> the important thing is you have interconnecting pores. So if you take such a, such a wedge of the ceramic foam, put a drop of water on it, it goes, to, it goes through. And the same will happen if you put it into the body with the blood and with the cells, etc. cetera. Um, of course, biological evaluation according to the standards was done for that kind of material successfully, but I can imagine that you are more interested in how that grows in. And I have two studies for you um, today, and I want to show you the results. 
The first one was uh, for a bulk material with a porous coating on top. So the first version I mentioned before, put into sheep in two versions, a smooth one and a coated one with pores. And of course, what we have seen here is the smooth one uh, doesn't show any um, proper bone contact. You get fibrous tissue in between, while the porous structure got a perfect bone contact and the uh, respective uh, push-out forces um, with regard to the uh, uh, secondary fixation. Second example is the foam alone. Once again, in an animal study, this time in rabbits. And what you see here is in the middle of that uh, cross section, you see the ceramic foam. Um, the bone is completely gr uh, grown through the foam. You, you don't see any differences in the bone density. Yeah. The foam is perfectly integrated. And um, what you also can see, which is highlighted here, that on the uh, periosteal side, you get a nice um, covering with uh, collagenous tissue, which could also be interesting for applications like dental implants, where you have two different interfaces, ceramic to bone and ceramic to weak tissue. With that, I come to my summary. As I have shown you, you can ceramics deploy, apply in a dense state and a porous state for different kind of applications. Um, we have a high wear, uh, we have a high hardness, a good wear resistance. Can use a can use for articulating surfaces as well as for substrates. But the important factor, which is uh, which stands over all others, is the biocompatibility, which is excellent for ceramic materials. And with that, I come to my conclusion. Whenever you, need, whenever you need to design a, um, a veterinary implant where you have the requirements with regard to strength, star biology, et cetera, um, it's worth to consider ceramics due to its perfect and uh, excellent biocompatibility. Um, and maybe then you have the excellent solution you are uh, looking for. And of course, um, we support QN and our customers with our ceramic expertise and our manufacturing expertise to design these kind of implants. With that, I thank you for your attention. Great, great, thank you. Um, we've got a few minutes, so I think uh, we'll we'll tackle one of one or two of these questions. Um, Oh, the first one actually is more for Domenica. Um, will the presentation and the slides on the THR pathway be shared afterwards? Everything from today is going up on the website, right? So that will be available afterwards. And then the other question, it's, it's gone off my screen. Oh, the other question was <coughs> if it is possible to have an experienced surgeon assisting and helping during the hip surgery in their own clinic. So that's a question for Otto. It's, uh, I'm just to clarify just a few points before I answer that. Do you mean that you have already taken the Keon course, the hip course, and, and you're already doing surgery and you're going to have another experienced surgeon help you, or you've never done a Keon total hip and you're going to have somebody come in and, and help you? So this is a question from one of our remote uh, viewers. Oh, okay. So I don't know which which way they were thinking, okay. but if you well, could, just to, I could just do both scenarios. Yeah. I, I think um, if you have not taken the course to have somebody outside, in essence, train you to do a a key on total hip, it would not really be permissible. It's better to go to the course and and have us train you and and then go on to do hips but if you've already done that you've taken the intermediate course you've done your cadaver works and then you're gonna go ahead and start doing uh standard total hips then yes that that would be allowed great thank you very much can i just have a show of hands in the room who is doing regularly um total hip replacement in in here so about five or oh, more 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 maybe six or seven of us of, of you, not me. I'm obviously not doing them. Um, so that's that's great that there's some experience in the room. Um, any other, while well, we still have a couple of minutes, any other questions from the room for either Aldo or Otto? No? Okay. Um, in that case, we do have um, about five minutes before the next 
talk is, is due to begin. I think we'll stick to that and we'll start in five minutes time at uh, 20 minutes to the hour, just in case anyone's joining us online and wants to see the, the beginning of the talk. No, we won't. We'll go straight to it. Um, <laughs> because what Domenica asks for, she gets. Um, so a slight slight change of pace now, away from, away from the hip. Uh, and we're going to talk about PGR. And uh, our next talker, uh, next speaker is also a remote, uh, a remote speaker. Svetoslav Hristov is uh, coming to us remotely from uh, United Veterinary Clinic in Bulgaria. And... Uh, he's going to talk to us about his own personal experience of using PGR. So I will hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you see my, my slides? Yes. All right. Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. So it's a real pleasure and it's a privilege to share my experience uh, with PGR. I'm sorry that I couldn't, I had some technical problems and couldn't bore my background. So everybody now is uh, welcome to my living room. Um, so my first uh, um, Am I able to, to change the slide as well? OK, so um, my first uh, experience with PGR was started a few years ago when I had to deal with a large breed dog. Actually, it was a giant breed dog with uh, concurrent cranial cruciate ligament rupture and uh, lateral patella luxation, a chronic lateral patella luxation. And uh, so we have to combine um, um, cranial cruciate ligament surgery uh, with uh, patella groove replacement. And I was actually very amazed and uh, how this dog actually recovered after the surgery. And I was very happy with the long-term outcome as well. Um, since then, we have implanted 24 uh, PGR implants. And uh, in three dogs, we have done it uh, bilaterally in a, in a stage surgery. So we have used pretty much, I think, almost all of the sizes of uh, PGR, including now the new available uh, one and a half and two and a half sizes. Um, <clears throat> so I understand patella luxation as a problem of malalignment between uh, quadriceps mechanism and the patella and uh, uh, also the tibial and the femoral axis. So that's why I actually appreciate patella groove replacement as a surgery that treats not the primary patella luxation, but the consequence of the patella luxation. So we always try to identify what are the underlying skeletal um, uh, abnormalities that leads to the patella luxation, and then the consequence of patella luxation. Uh, we in the concept for the consequence, we actually are using a PGR as a surgery technique. So most of the cases um, we actually found as a good candidate based on uh, diagnostic uh, um, imaging modalities, and of course the the most appropriate, the most popular ones are uh, radiographs. And even if you perform a simple medial lateral view, in some of these cases, you can um, appreciate flattening of the trochlear ridge and also concurrent flattening of the back of the patella. Uh, if you do some more um, advanced or more tricky, I would say, positioning like a skyline views, you can also appreciate the shape of the trochlear ridges and you can also uh, check what is the depth of the trochlea. Of course, more and more uh, CT is used for diagnostic uh, and especially for the appreciation of the abnormal, um, of the skeletal abnormalities in these cases. So from the CT, you can also um, uh, understand and have the information about what it's, uh, how the trochlea looks like. And also you can uh, see the shape of the trochlear ridges and et cetera, et cetera. And also in these days, we are using more and more um, the uh, ultrasound as a diagnostic uh, uh, modalities. 
So pretty much more, most of the cases that are uh, um, appropriate for PGR are, uh, looks like this. Um, as we know, uh, patelloluxation is a good model for development of osteoarthritis. Um, so in many cases we find a trochlea that is um, completely covered by osteophytes and because of this massive osteophytosis, simply there's no room for the patella anymore in the trochlea. Sometimes, like the case on the right up, you can see a new trochlea formed and actually covered by almost normal cartilage, and um, contrary to the normal trochlea, which doesn't have a cartilage at all, and has a, just a very thin layer, probably a very soft cartilage, or like a synovial membrane just covering the subchondral bone. In some cases, like uh, the case, uh, the picture in the middle, you can see that there is a completely wear of the trochlear ridge. And these are cases that we often see like um, in um, chondrodystrophic type of uh, breed dogs, like uh, French bulldogs, for example, where the patella is riding over most of the time on the medial trochlear ridge, in the medial patella luxation, of course. Um, in these cases, there is a completely wear of the trochlear ridge. And also in some cases, um, a fracture of um, uh, interarticular fracture where the um, uh, the femoral condyle cannot be reconstructed, or in some more probably exotic cases where there is a, a fracture, isolated fracture of the trochlear ridges, the medial or the lateral one. So um, <clears throat> these are these were pretty much my indication for for this surgery. In terms of uh, preoperative planning, we are using a traditional uh, way of uh, templating uh, based on uh, preoperative radiographs or based on 3D reconstructed and calibrated CT images. Um, so as I mentioned, we always try to find the what are the underlying skeletal abnormalities in this case and try to treat them uh, as a first step. Uh, so it's not surprising that uh, many of my cases actually were in combination with some additional uh, corrective osteotomy surgery. Actually, in all of these cases, only in two cases, we applied uh, just a PGR as a sole treatment. And it's not surprising surprised to say that in, in these two cases, we had we couldn't achieve actually stability of the patella into the trochlear prosthesis. So these cases end up with uh, reluxation. So in nine of our cases, a PGR was combined with any kind of variation of uh, tibial tuberosity transposition. In one case, actually, a patella alta was identified as the only reason for medial patella luxation. So we had to uh, distalize the patella first, and then we applied uh, a PGR implant. Um, and this is one of these cases, is a, a pack, a male pack, five years old. Um, and in this case was identified that there is a, a little bit less than 10 degrees of external tibial torsion. Uh, there was a kind of very slight uh, distal femoral varus, uh, about 100 degree of anatomical lateral distal femoral angle, and the angle of antiversion was 23 degrees. So in this case, um, we have used a uh, tibial tuberosity transposition to correct the external tibial torsion in combination with uh, patella groove replacement size uh, 2 implant. A little bit of uh, criticism could be done probably in this case because uh, we are able actually to compensate a little bit of this deformity. Um, for example, this white distal femoral virus could be compensated by a position of the trochlear prosthesis in a little bit more straight way. Um, which I probably, I definitely didn't achieve in this case. But if you compare to the to the second uh, X-ray uh, on the right, uh, this is another case, of course, where actually this was achieved uh, by just a straighter position of the trochlear prosthesis. So this is the dog walking, just uh, um, I think like uh, two months or probably a little bit less after after the surgery. Um, in four of our cases, we have combined uh, patella groove replacement surgery uh, with uh, any sort of uh, femoral osteotomy. Most of the time was a uh, um, uh, ostectomy, distal femoral ostectomy to, to uh, correct a distal femoral varus. 
plus or without uh, tuberous tuberosity transposition again. In one case, uh, PGR was used to treat a traumatic a gunshot fracture of the lateral trochlear ridge of the femur. In this case, we uh, stabilized the fracture first uh, because we were concerned about uh, possible fracture, uh, possible bacterial contamination, and then we went back and uh, up, uh, inserted also the PGR implant. Okay. Um, in six of, six of our uh, cases, we had a combination of cranial cruciate ligament rupture uh, together with um, cranial cruciate ligament uh, in the cranial cruciate ligament, ligament surgery, in to get, together with a patella groove replacement. Um, in in four of the cases, actually, PGR was combined with TPLOM. Again, not surprisingly, but just because there was some, uh, there are many cases of uh, tibial torsion in in these cases. So uh, we have used TPOM in order to compensate the, um, uh, the tibial torsion. So here is, uh, this is one of the uh, cases with, when we have combined a PGR with TPO. Um, that's another case, uh, um, a little bit um, a bigger animal. Uh, this is uh, like a Jacarus Terrier mixed breed dog. Um, when um, we identified as a reason for medial patellar luxation only, again, external tibial torsion, somewhere about 10 and 15 degrees. So in this case, um, um, uh, PGR was combined with uh, uh, TPLOM in order to lateralize uh, the tibial tuberosity. And you can also see the dog walking here. <clears throat> So that's approximately one month after the surgery. So most of the cases actually cover pretty well, even after um, such a um, uh, complex, I would say, surgery. In one much more complicated case, we have to treat um, um, a dog that was previously treated for a cranial cruciate ligament uh, uh, rupture. Uh, unfortunately, the stifle was still unstable, and then in the combination with the medial, uh, chronic medial patellar luxation. So we have to uh, treat uh, excessive distal femoral virus by performing a, a distal femoral uh, ostectomy uh, in combination with uh, PGR, and then a TPO over a TTA in order to stabilize the knee in the sagittal plane. Probably one of the most uh, difficult and tricky surgeries um, in the PGR surgeries that I have uh, in, in, in my uh, caseload was a very, very small um, miniature Yorkshire uh, with a weight of 1.2 kilograms. Um, <clears throat> this dog is a typical example for hypoplastic femoral condyles where uh, the condyles actually are so flat, so uh, it's simply not possible, it's not feasible to perform any traditional um, uh, trochleoplasty uh, procedures, um, just because uh, you're going to uh, violate the intercondylar space and the possibility of fracturing of uh, one of the femoral condyles is, is too high. Um, also, in this case, there was a severe distal femoral virus, approximately uh, 119 degrees of anatomic lateral distal femoral virus angle. Uh, also, excessive uh, external tibial torsion was far above uh, 20 degrees, and the an angle of uh, antiversion was uh, 19 degrees. So it's uh, um, clear that we cannot use uh, simply as a, a PGR as a sole treatment to compensate these severe deformities. So we really needed to, to do some corrective osteotomy in order to um, align the limb and the, to the quadriceps mechanism. Um, it's also clear that we cannot use a, a procedure like a tibial tuberosity transposition just because um, the tibial torsion was uh, um, away uh, more than uh, what is acceptable uh, as a 20 degrees to, treat it, to be treated with a simple tibial tuberosity transposition. So in this case, because we um, expected that it's going to be much tricky and it's um, going to be takes longer in the surgery, we, pre uh, we decided to um, to print the bone models in order to uh, try to mimic the surgery before uh, we really jump into the real surgery uh, to um, contour our implants 
to check if there are enough room into the distal femoral uh, segment for the screws of the distal femoral plate and for the base plate of the patella groove prosthesis. Um, and also to reduce our uh, interoperative time. Um, I wish I had a smaller uh, PGR implant at that time, but this is uh, obviously the smallest size that is available. It's a size one, which um, uh, actually looks too big for this dog, but again, this is what we have. Um, so this is the dog walking approximately one month after the surgery, and it's uh, with um, a, seems to be with a good alignment and with a good uh, weight bearing um, after the surgery. In terms of complications, uh, we had one case of uh, was a technical um, error from from my side uh, that uh, there was a malalignment of the um, trochlear prosthesis. Um, but without uh, a clinical uh, consequences, so it was not uh, further treated. And then in, two, in three cases, actually, we had a patella relaxation. As I mentioned, as I mentioned in two cases, uh, these are the two cases where I applied um, a PGR as a sole treatment. So I think I learned my lesson. And uh, one additional comment that probably I could um, do here is that despite during the surgery um, that uh, the patella seems very stable into the trochlear prosthesis. Um, this could not be true and it could not be same after the surgery. So we should not rely on the interoperative, probably uh, just checking because um, there are no mu muscle forces. So if we don't align the quadriceps mechanism, um, uh, probably uh, we're going to face uh, a relaxation of the patella again. So thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to the end of this mini session. Um, we will be breaking for coffee here in the room shortly. But before we do that, I just wanted to give uh, anyone a chance to ask any questions of any of our speakers, any of the last four speakers. Yes. Christoph, nice talk, thank you very much. Um, I would like to know if you do anything with the patella to get it in shape to fit for the patella groove. So I think, um, I think your, uh, your, the sizes of the, of the implants were a little bit small um, comparing to that w w which, I t which I use. So I use always a little bit bigger sizes compared to yours, yeah. not to touch the patella. So I do not um, narrow the patella or do not cut the patella into shape. Do you do this? So I, I have never performed a patelloplasty procedure in, in my uh, PGR cases. Um, I think uh, I would appreciate what you said that my uh, PGR implants were a little bit smaller probably in the beginning of when I started using PGR and then I simply oversized a little bit. I was a little bit um, worried about this tensioning effect on the on the knee if you are using too you know too wide uh, uh, implant. But um, no, my answer is I have never done a patelloplasty in these cases. That could be probably an option if you deal with cats. So if you, I have no experience with cats, but I know that some people do also uh, PGR in cats. So in, in these cases, probably you have to do uh, a patelloplasty. But in dogs, I have never done it. I wonder if e either of our other um, remote speakers would like to chip in there. Hey, Dan, can you hear me? Yes. Um, just to answer the question about the, you know, the, the patella, I do sometimes, and I'll be interested to hear what Aldo and even uh, Luca have to say as well, but I do remove some of the osteophytes when I do a PGR when they're very large, um, especially uh, the medial and lateral osteophytes, um, but I'll be interested to hear what Aldo has to say. Yes, um, 
Yes, I agree. Uh, although I think that in many cases, uh, particularly in very chronic cases uh, of uh, four degree patella luxation, the patella is quite deformed with osteophyte all around the fibrous tissue. And so we usually trim the size uh, to reshape the patella. So we provide patelloplasty, uh, taking care to preserve, of course, the uh, quadriceps attachment uh, and also the patella tendon, of course. But we want to have a good seating of the patella inside the groove. And so I think that particularly in those cases, it's quite important to do patelloplasty. Thank you all very much. Uh, we do have one more question that's coming from our remote audience, uh, which is, again, for our, uh, for our final speaker, I, I guess, but probably for all of them. Uh, very nice presentation. How would you approach a medial patella luxation surgically when planning to also do a TPLO? Um, this I don't I don't think this is a problem. So we simply need uh, two different approaches, or just a, a single approach. But the uh, the cut is going to be more in a bleak way. Um, so if you if the probably the participant ask about the position of the dog we might probably do it in the in a dorsal recumbency uh, so we can approach either um, so we can approach the, the lateral aspect for positioning of the implant uh, the pgr and then for the medial aspect for for the tpo thank you it looks like we don't have any more questions in the room uh, and none remotely. So uh, I think with that, we'll draw this session to a close or this mini session to a close.